give his credit card details. Yeah. Um. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank furlough. It's Friday once again. And believe it or not, it's the 5th of February. We've already lost one twelfth of the year, already gone. I hope you're enjoying the year. You're starting to see an end to the tunnel that we've been talking about for the last 12 months. Well, nearly 12 months. Uh, don't know about you, but um, here we're getting what I think used to be called April showers. It throws it down with rain. And the next thing you know, the sun comes beating down. So it's looking really nice. The garden's looking good. And as ever, our flower out in Kent there, Jackie Mount is with us again today. So uh, waiting to regale you with all that's new, important. Jackie, how are we doing? Fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, quite a quiet week this week, actually, believe it or not. Uh, a few bits and pieces came out from uh, HMRC regarding the coronavirus and some minor changes. But I did pick up a couple that if you're reading if you get the emails through and various things about changes. So there were a few things that could be a bit scary, but actually they're not when I looked into them. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. There's just one or two, literally a few uh, topics that I want to go through with you. Um, this came out from my HMRC contact on the tax agent group that I sit on with all the other professional bodies. And these are the updates that they've made. Um, there is an interesting one going through here. You might see that everywhere they have put this comment, there is no right of appeal. Now, that doesn't mean that if they come back to you to say, we're checking, you know, we don't think your uh, coronavirus check, uh, claims are correct. We want you to look into it. This is, I think, as I've read it, um, that if you are not eligible, to take part in that and the decision is taken that you're not eligible then there is no right of appeal to that i don't think that is a right of appeal against what you're actually claiming and various things like that so that goes right the way through um, there's some updates on uh the calculator page they seem to keep thinking more and more things and changing the calculator and uh it's more when you can use it and when you can't now the one thing I did want to pick up on this on using the calculator and particularly the bit about how much you can claim. This is uh, this one here. Um, and clarification on pension increase on pay increases and things. Now, I was talking to a member this morning and we've had this query before and the situation is that there is um, one of her clients has uh, had some people on furlough on and off since the beginning of the year. They're a very small business. They employ uh, four or five uh, people. And once the sort of shutdown happened, they were all put on furlough. And then when we opened up again in June, there was an agreement that some of the staff took basically took redundancy and some ended up working slightly more hours. So they're working more hours now than they were when they first uh, were first furloughed. And now that they're on a flexible furlough scheme, we were discussing how to actually calculate the flexible furlough. Because if you look at all the information that's coming out, it still states that if you're on a flexible furlough pay, you can pay them the higher of either the previous 12 months going up to March, April 20, no, up to February 20, or the relevant month's income. Now, uh, this is still going round and round because I've had a couple of discussions with people in the last few days. Now, what I found this morning, and I found it in two different places on gov.uk, is that with the flexible furlough, it definitely states the agreed normal working hours. And it does not say the average hours that you they were earning, they were working prior to last March. So I'd be interested if anyone's got any comments to come back on this, but as we both a member and I, as Lisa and I understood it this morning, that if they've been on an RTI since say June, so that there is evidence they, they've been working a larger, a higher number of hours than they would have done previously. And they've done five or six months on this and have now gone to flexible furlough, that the number of hours that they're working normal hours is as their current contract, not what the, they would have been doing back in February, because there's quite a difference in the number of hours this particular employees working. 
But if you look at the rate they're being paid, we looked this morning at still using the old minimum wage rate. Now, what I did find down here was clarification on pay increases. And I have to say, I've literally just spotted that and I haven't had a chance to look that up yet. So if you're in this situation, go on to this, calculate how much you can claim um, on gov.uk and have a look through that if you still want some clarification on the flexible furlough. But that's all I've managed to find uh, uh, that's come through to me this week. But there is one other thing that's come through from HMRC, and that is this message here. Now, rather than you read it all, I will put that email up on the, um, the side uh, chat line for you to copy down. But basically, we were talking last week about the VAT deferral payments. Uh, these are the deferred VAT from March in, to June last year. And the fact that they can be paid over the next year up to March 22 and that the scheme was not going to open yet. Now, actually, what they're looking at now is next week they're testing the scheme out. So if there is anybody who's got clients that you want to register them for this in advance and use this as a test scheme, there is an email that you can go to and they will open uh, up the test to you. Um, they do want to try it for a while. Um, it does say here it does not require specialist software and is a self-guided journey rather than one completed by an agent. Now, I therefore don't know whether agents can do that. It doesn't say agents cannot do this, it's a, but it is a self-guided journey. But what I will do is um, I will put this email, I will copy this and put it into the chat line. So if anybody is interested in that, then please do uh, go away and have a look at it. And to be perfectly honest, that is all I have for today that's new. So I'm just gonna put what? up that email address there if anybody wants to copy it. Uh, so we've got... Uh, there's one from, oh, there's one from Catherine that says, there is guidance in the section that states, if an employee has received significant overtime, then it can be taken into account in the calculation. So I think for now, they I think they've accepted that everything's moved along a lot since last year. But what's confusing me, and I have to say these days, there's so much coming out of gov.uk. I'm getting confused quite easily. Um, there does seem to be some confusion. Uh, I think I've just put it up there, Sylvia. There does seem to be some confusion between where they're saying that you have to still use the average pay from last year to looking at what are the normal working hours currently. So I'll uh, be guided by you as to as to what you think um, is actually going to happen there. Yeah, good. Um, right. One uh, question. Hopefully got that. Yeah. Who's from? Uh, oh, no name. Hi, I've submitted CGRS claim for January 2021 this morning. However, I think that I have an error. Am I able to resubmit the claim? Thank you. You can make changes to the claim up until I think the um, 28th, 28th of February. The deadline for making the claim is the 15th, 14th or 15th of February, and you have till the end of the month to make changes to the claim. I think the claims for December are now completely closed but you can still amend your claim, I think, um, until there. But I think it's an amendment rather than uh, a resubmit, but not quite sure how you would do that. So you'd need to log in and, and see how you resubmit that. So it's a bit like a card, or you get until the hour, a couple of hours before they deliver for you to make a change. Then. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think that's about right, really, yeah. <laughs> right, what else have we got on? I've got another one coming through uh, on the chat line. Uh, Kirsty St. John. Hi, Kirsty. Hi, Kirsty. From what I have read, it is okay to pay CGRS for... Oh, that's that gone. Right. To pay CGRS for scheme started 8th of June 2020, but can't seem to claim for COVID SSB as the PAYE scheme wasn't open before the 28th of February. Seems odd stroke unfair. Um, let me think about that, Kirsty, for a minute, and I'll, I'll answer that. Um, the, PA, the PAYE scheme, I thought, started on the 1st of March. I don't think it was it wasn't open before then. Mm. Uh, let me come back to you one on that one, Kirsty. I'm not quite sure about that one. Um, Judith, yeah. hello, Judith. I had a similar furlough issue, but the other the other week, but it was the other way around. 
March, someone worked five days in the summer, went to three, now back on furlough. They've complained they want five days furlough. HMRC, I have to use what they were being paid in March. So we'll get five days, even though he, the temporary contract changed to three days in the summer. That's a difficult one, that one, because we, we Lisa and I were reading it this morning as if it has to be done as in February, March, but it definitely says agreed hours. So I think I'm going to take this one back to HMRC. Because this and because the claim time is so short now, I will try and get answers uh, for you very quickly. Um, Somebody right. says, first is query. I've had a case like this. Very unfair. Refer to MP. No joy. Yeah. And somebody there, Jackie, Maggie, <laughs> just saying, can't see the VAT email. Um, we'll check into that. We'll get our, um, our man on that, Alex, who's anchoring today. I just posted it into the chat line again. It's VAT infrastructure COVID-19 policy at hmrc.gov.uk. So hopefully you can Both see Health says, my sound isn't working and it is quite entertaining watching Jackie without it. Sylvia, I've tried that many times myself. Oh. <laughs> it's a good don't excuse. Shout, don't shout too much, Sylvia. It'll make you take my sound off altogether. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you're on mute, as I say, is something that's now <laughs> off the English dictionary, I think, of, uh, of phrases and sayings. Um, I mean, this is probably about the shortest um, we've ever done at yeah. the moment. Jackie, unless you've got questions I, yeah, honestly there's been they've been very quiet this week there's you know just tweaking because yeah. nothing new has come out this week that i didn't announce from since i made the announcements last week on there was quite a lot came out last week but not much this week well we know we have yeah. very busy members so um we've always said that when we've got something to say we'll say it but if not we're not going to keep you waffling on or, or anything else or yeah. you know we're going to keep you online because that's, that's not yeah. really um alex i'm not sure everyone's saying they can't see my posting up there well that's because it goes to panelists um is there any way perhaps um perhaps alex can get something up somewhere. he's got more chance than that than yeah yeah I'll, alex is sitting behind he'll 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 yeah. do that don't worry i'm sure we'll if not um we'll get, we'll it, get it out to you somehow yeah we'll get it out to you we know who you are we know who you are uh, um kiwi 66 says i think when i've used the calculator it asks is it variable i'm guessing overtime would be you just follow the questions and keep the hmrc answer for claim there's dates from the from old start dates and maybe year-to-date gross figures and all sorts of questions i just had to believe the calculator faye yes i mean the these are getting more and more complicated. I think in the early days they were easy, but now we've moved so far into the new tax year. Um, HMRC haven't moved their furlough scheme along with it, I think. But I will, I will try and get a definitive answer on this one. Um, if Lisa's listening, it looks as though we we may not get a not get away. We may not be successful with what we were discussing this morning. I'll contact Lisa. Judy Siddle has asked. Um... Can I ask your opinion? Yep, Judith, that's exactly what we're all here for. Is it okay for directors to be furloughed if all staff are working full hours? Probably not, do you think? No, I mean, I yeah. again, this is an ethical one. Again, it depends on what the director is doing because if the director has no work and has nothing to do with the operation, day-to-day -day operation of the business and is purely dealing with tasks for keeping the business legally running then the answer to that was yes you can furlough but I think if all your staff are working and you're a director and you've always been working and you're taking any part in the organization of the business at all then I think the answer to that is ethically is definitely no yeah I think so and if I was a director that suddenly wasn't necessary to my organization i don't think i'd be very pleased either so no you know, and uh, you know if yeah. if the direct again if the director doesn't have a job should the director be taking a salary on paye nicola payne asks the new technical icb tvs i presume this is your tuesday she's talking about technical tuesday are they available to see after the event i know they are for members only they should be going up. I know the team were, we've got a new system for putting this up for members only. Um, my, uh, the one I did two weeks ago, uh, 
week ago last Tuesday is definitely up on the Brexit hub. And I know what they're trying to that what, what the team are trying to do is to put a Brexit webinar hub so that all four links are there, four or five, I think it is now are there. And I know we've got Mike on Monday and there will be other member only webinars coming up there. So if you can bear with us, um, if anybody, if it doesn't go up, I think the slides are up there. So you can actually get the slides, if not see the presentation. I think the slides are up there. Bev Arnold, hi Jackie. You may remember a while ago, I was in touch about a client who had been digitally excluded from making an online claim for CJRS because yeah. they re-employed people who were made redundant. I have now made two manual claims for HMRC, but it requires a callback from a technician. It is taking 15 working days for a callback. Currently on day 13 for the January claim, still waiting for a call. I just wondered if anyone else was having similar problems and if anyone has found a way of getting HMRC to fix the online issue rather than relying on manual claims. They've confirmed eligibility and processed two claims manually, finding this very frustrating. Thanks, Bev. I mean, considering we're supposed to be going making tax digital and it's their big flagship, um, yeah, you'd think they'd do this, wouldn't you, really? Yeah, um, and I, I, I don't know is the answer to that one. Um, I would hope that they would allow you to make the claim. We've got until, you've actually got until, I think it's 14th or the 15th for the January claim. So. Actually, did come back about our comment uh, and, and says, thanks for confirming <laughs> my thinking. I told them they should be working hard to get more work for the staff. Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. who's going to crack the whip if, if you're not there? Listen, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. I mean, it is a difficult one. And I, I think you, you've got to be realistic. And if you're the bookkeeper, uh, quite often you will be required to bring a bit of realism in. And from what we've heard, uh, you know, if, if you put out the case and say, look, this is the way it should happen. Most clients are very pleased of the advice. And yeah, they, they thought they might chance it, but they don't. And they do exactly as they're told. It's nice to know that uh, our ICB bookkeepers have uh, got a lot of control out there, which I think is important. Um, and particularly as judging by the releases that I'm starting to get at the moment, there are a lot of people out there who have been fiddling claims and are now trying to come up with a mass of excuses to, uh, for what they've done. And, uh, you know, we'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I know there are some, some quite big um, cases coming up where people are going to be asked to pay back some money with a bit of interest and a penalty. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I, I think it'll just show that people who relied on a damn good bookkeeper, an IC bookkeeper, ICB bookkeeper, um, did the right thing. And, and that's the whole point, really. Um, yes, and you do have to stand your ground because um, we've got quite a few members at the moment who are having issues with um, accountants saying certain things and them saying, no, we've been told it's this. And, you know, that is causing a few issues at the moment as well with a number of members that, you know, um, if, if you're I, in I don't, their case. I don't wish to pile the pain onto accountants because I'm, no. I'm criticised for being anti-accountants. However, the number of complaints that we're getting at the moment about accountants who are wanting to look at the books differently and in the eyes of our members wrongly uh, is it's just going through the roof at the moment. Mm. Um, and I, I think the difference, I always, I always say, I was asked in, in Parliament recently, um, sounds very posh, but side of Parliament, um, what is the difference between the way that bookkeepers and accountants look at look at their clients. And I said, well, um, very generally, accountants quite often say, I'm here to say, stop you paying tax. And we say, we're here to make you pay the tax that you are due to pay. And, and we come at it, I think, from a, if it happens, it's in the books. Um, and, and there is no creativity, which perhaps sometimes uh, brings up this, this phrase of creative accounting. And if any of you are having these problems, whether they're resolved or not, it would be useful if you could perhaps uh, drop a note into customer service and, and they'll pass it through to me because I've now been asked to uh, write a report on what our members are finding. And I've got several quite serious cases. Jackie knows of one recently where we were talking about, you know, a fraud of over 200,000 um, pounds. I think most, in most cases, it's relatively minor, but if you do have firsthand experience, mm. um, you won't, I won't, Put anybody's name forward they will be annotized um but or uh, redacted but 
it would be very helpful just to make sure it's not something I've dreamt up overnight, which I don't think it is, but we will wait and see. We had, we had one this morning, Gary, on the, uh, on the CGRS claim where a previous accountant um, had, had done the CGIS right up until fairly recently and had been claiming everything based on the average uh, income uh, that each person was earning per month rather than the higher of the average and the monthly. And they're maintaining now that they're right and our member is wrong and uh, actually now refusing because they've now been, uh, have actually been cancelled by the client. The client's not using them anymore. And we've got an, an, and the client has an issue because they can't get the furlough calculations from the accountant. So, you know, you're supposed to keep these for six years. And they can't get them. So that's, you know, there's all sorts of things going on at the moment. Um, yeah. Sylvia, you will be pleased to see now has, hear now has sound, Gary. So she can hear. <laughs> Good. That's great. I noticed she didn't complain about me not hearing me. It was only about not hearing you. But I, anyway, I, I wasn't even going to go down that road, Gary. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, actually, the um, case come up in the, in the papers where an accountant, um, had, sorry, not the accountant, the, a client with an accountant has just been found guilty of defrauding uh, the revenue by, uh, sorry, HMRC, the revenue, I'm showing my age, uh, by charging VAT on invoices and then using that money for other purposes. And the accountant, who's been their accountant for, I think, seven or eight years, has missed this for the last four years. Now, this is 400,000. How do you miss the fact that somebody is putting VAT on an invoice when they're not that registered? Um, and 400,000? I mean, um, I gather the accountant didn't think it was their place to do anything about it. <laughs> so, as we always say, folks, when you're out there, it's your place to, to keep your um, your clients in tow. And if, if they say, well, you just do as you're told and I'll sort it out later, that's never been an excuse as far as we're concerned. And I'm pleased to say that at the moment, and I'm going to touch wood, um, you know, we, we haven't had any cases like that coming up. So um, I'm hoping that you've all got the message. And it, I mean, how, how does that work? Um, I just don't understand at all. So presumably they weren't looking at his invoices. But even if he was falsifying the invoices, when you do a bank rec, surely you can see that different amounts of money are coming in to what is going on. In, I mean, I don't know. It it really it really um, blows the mind a little bit. Um, OK, Alex has put the links up to uh, the, uh, the webinars and the videos and the slides and everything. So if you have a look down there, the links are all there. Uh, go on to uh, our website, click on to resources, the Brexit hubs, and you'll, you'll see all the links are there. Um, one question on uh, EU VAT that I'm going to come back to in a moment. That's Olivia. I'll come back to that. Um, all the slides and webinars are there. Yeah, I think they're all, I think they put them up this week. Um, Kiwi 66, oh, Faye, hi, Faye. Faye's come back and said, under claims can be done on the web chat, but it still takes time but at least done in half an hour or so. All the questions you expect to see in the digital furlough claim, that's from Faye. Um, now, there is one quick question stepping aside from that, from Olivia on a VAT code. My currently uh, all, all, all most hated moment at the moment is EU VAT, I have to say. Um, is the VAT charge dependent on the location of the goods moving to and from rather than where the company is located? Now. This is a Northern Ireland company that registered in Northern Ireland selling goods to a B2B customer from a UK warehouse. Now, the B2B from Northern Ireland to a EU customer is just the old fashioned acquisitions EC sales. The goods are in a UK warehouse. That might be slightly different because you've got uh, to worry about import VAT going over. So, Olivia, I might have to look into that one for you. Um, okay, I'll look into that one. Um, 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 and Gary, perhaps you could take on the question and answer the one from the question from Peter at the bottom of question and answer. You might like to you read. Why are student members now excluded from certain webinars? For example, Mike on Monday. I have thought knowledge of money laundering is vital from an early stage in their training. Um, I agree with you, Peter. I am not 100% sure why. I think that was probably in order to try and restrict it to members. It was 
forgotten that you're actually a student member. So it's the way the information was fed into the software system. Um, and we will be putting that right. Yes, indeed. We do have some members, uh, and I'm obviously not suggesting you're one of them, but we do have some students who are setting up in practice without necessarily coming up into membership and getting a practice license. And we are taking that up with them accordingly. But that, that isn't the reason why we didn't do this. Um, you should, you, I'm, I'll talk to people again, just to make sure I know this was discussed mm -hmm. earlier in the week and I think it's been put right now. Um, yeah, we have this all the time actually, it's quite a difficult one because I know um, when we're doing things on, for example, uh, FRS 105 or on uh, self-assessment tax returns, a lot of members say, well, hold on a minute, I'm qualified to do this, so I don't want that to be talked about openly to people who are not qualified because they'll just nip in and try it and do it themselves because they'll think, you know, this is CPD or something or other, and uh, that they'll, they'll go away and do it. Well, first of all, if you've got something in a CPD, that's adding a few buzzers and bells to what you do. It is not core. It is not as significant as completing a self-assessment tax return. It's not as significant as doing payroll. You cannot, and we will not accept that as a CPD. I've got a certificate from somebody to say I turned up and, and was you know, present on the day. It's by examination only. And that's because it is very serious stuff. You've got to be good at it. And you know, I'm sure you wouldn't want to go into hospital and the doctor came in and said, well, I'm not qualified in this, but I've got a CBD certificate. So it's exactly that, that process. And um, we are having internal debates as to whether we should show you what you should be doing and then hope and follow up that you are doing it and you get qualified to do it. Um, and it's a difficult one. I mean, I, I think personally that if you see, actually, yes, I think I can do that and then I can add a new string to my boat, that is good. But we do have some people who uh, do come into our, our webinars, particularly uh, the sort of technical stuff that, that Jackie does and, and perhaps Peter's doing as far as education, Peter Stewart. Um, and we need to make sure that they are following through. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a um, difficult I mean, one. But I think that Ian, was an error in your case. Ian has just put up that the student membership bar also applies to Technical Tuesdays. Now, I have to say I was behind Technical Tuesday with what I've been doing for you about going to members only because once people have come into membership, they will have access to that anyway, because they will be able to get into that and see it, see it historically. However, with what I'm doing at the moment, any of those of you who sat with me through my five EU webinars, and thank you very much, and I think you're very brave, um, will realise just how complex this is. Now, if somebody is studying at level two at the moment and heading their way through to say paper A3, which is the computerized data entry. At the moment, my view always was that we really shouldn't be confusing them with the new changes to EU VAT because ICB is in the process of looking at its syllabuses, its exams. We're talking to the training providers about what's going to happen. And at the moment, with what they're being taught, although the, we're making arrangements for this, um, it's completely different to what they've been taught. And until they're ready and in membership and can pick this up, then I think it's wrong to confuse people with the issues of what we're currently testing at the moment. So yes, at the moment, Technical Tuesdays will have the student bar on them, but um, if that changes, then that's great. If not, when people come into membership, they can of course have access to this because I think it's available then to members and will be on the for, the for the foreseeable future, I think, if I'm right, Gary. Yeah, I, I think that is the case. I mean, we had a problem a little while back where somebody had uh, got through as far as their MA, they'd come into membership. They then strayed into doing self-assessment tax returns because they had a certificate from one of the software companies to say that they knew how to put it into their software. Well, putting information into the software is all very well, but if you don't know why you're putting it in or how you should be putting it in, then it's wrong. And, and you know, with the best will in the world, the software company is not there to qualify you they're there to enable you with your knowledge that you gain during the qualification or through a qualification to then put it across um, and into a software package to make your life a bit easier it's it doesn't take away the need for learning and it was brought home when we recently one one of our members um, um you know who we're having discussions with at the moment let's put it that way made a complete mess of things by not understanding what was going into the into the software 
and the software company, when I spoke to one of their people, uh, they just said, well, look, we don't say we're qualifying people. We're telling them that they have a certificate which says they can put the right figures in, it, it, you know, or put the figures in correctly. Sorry, it doesn't say that they are putting the correct figures in in the first place. And they sort of held their hands up and away mm. they went. The problem is that if you're not qualified in it, you're not insured either. So this particular lady's now got a problem because her client is really reading the riot act because it's made a huge difference to them on their self-assessment tax, um, yeah. on their, their COVID claims and all the rest of it. And yeah, they, they're now wanting, um, they're wanting blood basically. Uh, we're doing our best to support our member, but she's done something completely wrong. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I'd back, uh, sorry, Gary, I'll back you up on that one, because anyone who's ever studied IT knows the four letters GIGO, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. So if you're going to put the wrong figures in, you're going to get the wrong tax return out. And I have to say, um, that's why HMRC are pushing MTD so much, because the idea for that is that you will have this uh, transit trail, go, this audit trail going through this digital link for everyone, so that once you get to the end of your uh, annual accounts and you've done all your books and you reconciled everything then you can upload it to a tax software but you understand the figures that you're doing it and I've always maintained that you need to be running sets of books for clients for a couple of years before you go into doing things like SAT because uh, certainly I taught accounts probably for 20 years and then I came to join the institute I've examined accounts for years and then I actually went out for 12 years in practice and by golly it was different you know so Having, having seen it from both sides, I understand, you know, why when we send you out there to do this, you know, you've got to be so careful with what you're doing. Um, interestingly enough, Faze just put up a, a comment there about some webinars on zero at the moment and Receipt Bank um, that she's saying are absolutely amazing. Now, I know that zero is doing uh, a series of uh, webinars uh, this month, actually. I haven't looked at any of them yet, but I am booked in for one of them, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Faye. Yeah, I mean, that's Ron Baker. I mean, Ron is is well known to, to those of us in the profession. He's he's uh, American and he pushes this stuff pretty hard. Um, uh, fixed fees rather than hourly rates. I'd be interested to hear from any of you, those of you that you are fixed fee and those of you who are hourly rate, and hopefully you've got a mixture of them, which client have you found it hardest to keep charging? Because I know, you know, some of you are saying, well, I'm not doing as much work as I did because it's all remote. And others are saying I'm doing far more work because of all the claims. If you're charging somebody 500 pound a month or 100 pound a month or whatever it is, have you had a stronger kickback? Because they're saying, well, hold on, I can't afford to pay that now, rather than this is how many hours it's going to take me. And you agree that in advance and then you bill for it. I'd be, I'd be very interested to hear because, um, we've had people like Mark Wickersham talking to us about this and, you know, they've got a good story to tell. It's a great idea in principle. I know a lot of you do know, do work by it uh, and enjoy it. Say it's the best way to work and the clients like it, you like it. But I know others who say, uh, actually, the client doesn't like it. And I'm not ever quite sure whether it's actually the client or the, or the member that doesn't like it. But I'd, I'd be really interested to know if anybody's got any experience of that. Uh, can you, uh, again, drop a line into customer service. And I'll get somebody to forward that on to me and then I can have a look at that. And what we'll try and do is get a few different viewpoints up uh, on a future program and, and see what everybody thinks, mm -hmm. because, you know, they're, they're different times at the moment, uh, as you may have noticed. Actually, there's quite a few comments coming on that. Karen says, can earn more with fixed fees rather than hourly as the client knows what they're paying? Um, that's fine. I'm going to give the opposite view to that. What happens if you have a client and he suddenly rings you up? you know, day in, day out, giving you extra things, saying, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. You know, you're going to have an argument with them that it's in or out of your, your contract with them. So, you know, there's, there's two sides to every argument, I think. Margaret, yeah, well, hi, one, Margaret. Uh, I spoke to one this week, actually, and they were saying that their clients come back and say, well, as you haven't been doing so much for the last three months because we've been very quiet and we've been furloughed, uh, can I have my money back? Well, Margaret's just come and said, we and Margaret Crawford, hi, Margaret, uh, we invoice on value pricing, but in order to retain clients, we're having to redo to redo our quotations. And Karen said, oh, Judith says a mixture, depending on if I go into the office or not. And someone else says fixed fees with regular reviews works well for me. 
<laughs> and Karen says, change the fee if they become very difficult. Oh, yes. But I'm sure we, this one is going to go round and round, Gary. I know. I well, know. Ron, Ron and I had long conversations about this when, when I was across in America with ICB uh, in USA, and we were on a panel together. And uh, I sort of suggested that he it was the bookkeeper wanting to charge more for what they were doing and do less for what they were paying they were charging than actually helping out the client and he got a bit flummoxed at one stage so it'd be interesting to see whether whether he's, he's now a bit better at fending off those questions at, at the end of the day it's got to suit both sides and that's very very important you you can't thrust anything on people unless you want to be one of these bookkeepers who says, well, this is how I work, take it or leave it, in which case, again, it's up to the client to decide to either take it or leave it. And you, you, <laughs> you've, you've just got to sell whatever it is, you've got to sell to your client. Um, I've got two comments here, one from Sarah, one from Sylvia, both on the same line that says, uh, have fixed fees, but have a clause in your contract for all the extra work. And Sylvia apparently has just got a fair amount of income from a client. I'm not going to say how much it is, Sylvia. Um, and... Uh, on the basis that they've been given a lot of extra work because i know we've spoken about this ever since march although you may not be doing the bookkeeping because the the you know there may not be as many invoices i know and you know that you've been spending an awful lot of time dealing with all your cjr stuff and and helping them out with their furlough claims and i know members have spent hours doing this because i know um you know and where where there's been a query come back from HMRC and the hours and hours that I know at least one member spent who's on this afternoon who um, has spent trying to you know go back and check all the figures for the client and everything so yeah very difficult this one. The perfect answer is always the one that you and your client agree to <laughs> and it, it has to be varied I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Faye's made a comment there about uh, oh joint practice edition last year services are quite clear Anything like Fola would be an upsell, no clients complaining. No, I think that's right. I mean, I think that, oh, there's lots of things coming in there. Uh, there's another one here, another proposal. Well, I think this is a program for next week. Yeah, I think so. I think this might be a, this might be a, this, this one's going to go around. It might be worthwhile revisiting this seriously again, though, isn't it? Because it, yeah. we haven't actually talked about this. Um, so lots of... No, uh, I think we've left people to cope with it however they can at the moment but yeah we do need to look at it again um and there is a there is a strong view out there that actually bookkeepers uh aren't charging enough for their time and that uh, fixed fees might be the way ahead and and certainly we are noticing that that some people are still expecting bookkeepers to work for very small amounts but from the experience that we've got in people advertising jobs on find a job on the find a job service, it would appear that the, the figures are generally going up, and we're seeing more forty pound an hour now than we've ever seen. We've seen one fifty. There was a seventy pound an hour recently, um, and so yeah, I, I think it's a good time. But if people are migrating from accountants that they're paying one hundred fifty pound an hour for, seventy five pound an hour is an absolute bonus uh, so it could be that it's that sort of person and i haven't done the research i need to do the research or, or at least i need to find somebody to do the research and then i can come and tell you it's my idea uh, so we'll do that shortly um because yeah i think this is important and as we're coming out of this we can't be seen to be just stumping up the fees and i've just seen the news and it says that the uh, electricity and gas companies have just been given the okay to stump their money up and everybody's jumping up in arms this is coming at a bad time and everything else but you know they've got a bit more control because they can switch the gas cooker off or something like that um, we're not quite the same as that so you know i think we've got to work on this but during this year icb has got quite an extensive campaign coming up to promote icb to the end user to the business person and yeah we need to give them reasonable expectations of how much they're going to have to pay for this unfortunately none of us like paying too much for anything so you know it, it's always we're always going to want to negotiate mm. um there's an interesting comment from nadine who says you know they're not just paying for the work they're paying for your knowledge and expertise because i know they're they're sort of coming to you uh for, for with questions and you know propositions and also, you know do you think we can do this do you think we can do that um and Sarah said, this is goes, this one basically goes round and round in circles. As long as you're in agreement with your clients, then uh, do be careful because I know that some of these companies that offer this service are, are, are excellent, but I know some are very, very expensive and it's a question of whether you want to go down that route, but that's your own choice. 
Yeah. Another thing that we will discuss in the future, I'm putting a date in the diary, we haven't got it in there yet, is whether or not bookkeepers should farm out work to overseas um, lower income countries. So we had a, a conversation recently with an organization that they're based in the UK, but they are finding bookkeepers in the Philippines and India. And in the Philippines, they were saying that um, our hourly rate of just over £10 is a daily rate for a Philippine fully qualified chartered accountant. Now, there's a moral view. Obviously, that's not very much. But there's the other side of it, which is it is in the Philippines yeah. uh, for some people. So, you know, I, it's a difficult one, but because it's difficult, it doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, take a view. So what I want to do again, we, we will bring something out into the open to have a discussion about this to see if any of you have considered this. So this is passing out the number crunching and you doing the, uh, the, the sort of client visit bit again on fixed fees normally. What do you think about it? How, because we as an ICB have got to have a standpoint on things like this. And it's not for me to make it up. It's for you to guide me as the members to say, we like it, we dislike it. Oh, that's an idea, I haven't thought about it or whatever it's going to be. Um, so yeah, now, as I've just noticed, uh, Silver's just saying, are there ICB bookkeepers abroad? Yeah, actually in the Philippines, we've got, many thousand qualified bookkeepers. Uh, we've just opened an office in India, as uh, we mentioned recently, where we've already got uh, qualified bookkeepers. They tend to be pretty busy in India, but uh, you know there are people who are saying, well, hold on, we've got this availability. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of rules and regulations to make sure they've st still got the same ethical things there and, and everything else. So I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just asking whether we should be doing that or whether, you know, how do we look at it? Or is it always just going to be a minority? So therefore, those who want to can and those who can't, don't. So it's now we've got rid of COVID or we get, we, I'm told we get, we're getting rid of COVID by Easter or whenever we all get the jab or whatever it might be. I think we've got some pretty serious future of bookkeeping questions to put to you all because, you know, uh, I'm going to be engaging with government on a lot of fronts and you know money laundering is the big one they're always questioning us and they're looking at whether the FCA is doing its job properly, OPVAS, ICB, anybody else are doing their job properly um, and you know we think we are but whilst we're all now also now getting asked all sorts of questions well, what exactly does a bookkeeper do, are they important, where do they fit into the infrastructure uh, I know you all want to be able to sign off on uh, mortgages and various other things like that. Uh, and we're working on that. Although some of our members have done some really stupid things in the past. And unfortunately, whenever I go to an office, Zoom or real, um, people dust off this old file and find some member that we had 20 years ago who lied on a form or got a form wrong or something. Or other, and I'm fighting against that. So. I, I'm going to be putting together a lot more information. I've got some other people that will be uh, assisting. So a lot of people will be ringing you up and asking you for some help, hopefully, and asking for your impression. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I can make it up as I go along, but that, that's no good. Uh, I need to have the facts and figures. I need to know what you think. I need to know where you see the future of bookkeeping going. And I know you rely upon me and the team at ICB and Jackie and everybody else to be able to point you in a direction. But it does help if somebody helps us with, with the direction as well. So um, yeah, I agree. Expect a call from all sorts of people or email or reports or whatever. It, it's going to be a very, very busy year. And Pauline, I'm with you. I'm not going to say any more. I'm with you. Right. Um, lots going on here. I'm, uh, I, if people can see the chat line, you'll see the comments coming up about resourcing out. Uh, Sarah mentions about uh, ah. if you don't tell your clients about outsourcing, is that GDPR? There's an awful lot going on there. So I think probably what we'll do is uh, we'll we come back to this now. I do have a quick, someone's actually put a follow question in. If an employee <laughs> hands in their notice whilst on furlough, can the employer continue to claim furlough for them? as it's handing in notice, not redundancy. It is my understanding, Shelley, that if they're on a notice period, you can't claim the furlough for them because um, it is a job retention scheme. And if, that job, if, they, if they've handed in their notice. Now, that opens up a whole can of worms because you're actually paying them and not claiming it back for the time that they're working out their notice. So read the, read 
the detail on gov.uk and see if you read it differently to me but as i understand it it is all forms of statutory notice including um st standard uh, handing in your notice rather than redundancies um ah here we are this one's come up bev uh when preparing profit and loss accounts for the 2021 tax year do you think the sales grant should be included as part of business income the grant is taxable and needs to be declared for the year 2021 but in your view do you include it in the PL? um yes it is turnover it's taxable yeah. turnover and it, it's basically it's income that replaces your sales so you don't include it in your sales or your normal income you have to include it as a separate grant income line but it does come above the top line now i don't know till we get to next year's tax returns whether in fact there will be a new line on the sat was it 103 um sa 103 for grant income that might possibly come out or whether in fact there might be somewhere on there now for additional income but it certainly has to go in separately on its own line so i i would keep that on a on a separate line um it's not normal trading grant, normal grants don't get repaid do they so this is no, different no and this well the sales grant isn't repairable because it's taxable income but it's a question of uh it replaces right. trading income so it might be slightly different to yeah. um other forms of grants but i'm sure by the time you get to do your 2021 tax return on as you're all going to start doing on the 6th of april 2021 your clients are all going to come to you with with all their things saying can you please do my stat return yes they always do don't they no they don't um shelly says thank you jackie it's always questions on a friday afternoon which makes me doubt myself i can tell you shelly you're not the only one because i i get to the end of this and I always replay this through again, um, not because I like to hear myself and Gary talk or watch us talking again, but just to make sure so I can hear what I've actually said, pick up any glaring errors that I might have made and get in touch with you all and correct it very rapidly. <laughs> just in case, just in yeah. case. Um, um, next oh, yes, Anusha's come back and said, oh, yeah, that will be a good one. Wishful thinking reset. Yes. <laughs> Uh, before we came on air, Jackie was just saying that she'd heard recently of somebody who'd been telephoned and asked for, for their credit card details in order for them to purchase their uh, COVID injection. Mm. And, and I said, yeah, that there are a lot of scams about at the moment. And I think I mentioned recently, I sit on something called the Transparency Task Force, uh, which is a body of uh, people working in all sorts of financial uh, professions. And we had a, a discussion recently with uh, somebody who, who works on the money program on, on TV and was saying that the, the amount of scams and the value of scams is, is growing exponentially. And what I've done, I've spoken to them about trying to get uh, a couple of them to come on board. Now, we're hoping to do this next week. I'm not quite sure yet. I think Jackie was saying Technical Tuesday. Much, she might not want that slot this week because- uh, uh, I don't think I've got- I haven't got much more to go on to what I've already done. So I might do transport, uh, sorry, uh, transparency, transparency task force. Transparency, trans transparency right. Tuesday. Transparency Tuesday or something like that, if I can get um, the people on from the, the task force to come on as well. Because I think if you listen to some of these stories, they're quite horrendous. Now, uh, it's for your clients and it's for you as business people and also personally. So, you know, if it comes up, please listen in. Um, and also we're doing something very slightly different again on Wednesday. Now, I spend a lot of time, as do a lot of us, including the likes of Jackie and Sue Jay and, and Antonio that's on the front line and, and talking to you all the time, talking to you about some of the problems that you have with COVID. We all cross our fingers that we're coming out of this, but obviously it's thrown a lot of changes at you all in one go and we always talk about mental health and ways of relaxing and, and getting through it but you know i know some of you have got children um and you're trying to teach them how to uh, get online do their lessons do what they're told and one lady rang the other day and said you know my husband's driving me nuts he, he won't use the vacuum uh, you know and little things like this are just getting annoying and we're getting to the stage now after just coming up to 12 months where I think it's gone beyond a joke for some people. And, you know, OK, we've rallied through. We've had the gung ho British spirit. We can get through this. And now everybody's saying, well, when? And, and people are turning to different things. Um, but something cropped up when we were doing the recent um, uh, conference and we had some software. So I'm going to introduce you to 
our latest member of the ICB team. This ah. is Barkley. Now, Barkley's a brand new pup. He's, he's uh, 10 weeks old today, actually. And um, the reason I'm mentioning this is that one of the big things that people have said is that they rely on their dogs and pets and everything else. And we've had quite a few of uh, people. We had a whole room of dog fans, etc. So what we're going to do, we're going to have Woofer Wednesday next week. And what I want you to do, I want some of you to come on and bring your dogs on. Now, this isn't funny. It isn't for fun. I mean, it's quite serious, actually. I mean, bring the dogs on. But I'd like to know what you've done to get through the last, what is it now, 11 months, isn't it? You know, how have you coped? What have you done? What have you found has been the answer? You know, have you all become fitness fanatics? Have you all gone and lost that weight you wanted to lose? Or have you actually hit the biscuit tin and put it all on? I mean, um, it's a serious undertone. I mean, if um, you know, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge can talk about this, I'm damn sure we all can. So, you know, let, let's find out what it is that we've been doing. And what I'd like to do is get a couple of you. I don't know how many yet. I'll, I'll check out. Oh, here. Gary, if you look at the list, I think you're going to be inundated with offers because everybody is making comments on Barclay. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's get you on. Bring your woofer on or bring the cat or whatever it is you've got. Yeah, uh, we've got a um, cat lover here as well. Yeah, let's let's get you some let's get some of you on. Um and and just talk about, you know, how this addition to your workforce has, has made a difference. You know, um, have they kept you sane? Have you um, you know, suddenly taken on a, a new life because you you've got this new mate? Uh, we're a bit late in the day with this. I mean, just in case anybody wants to know how we got hold of a dog during COVID, I can assure you we we, we purchased the dog. Uh, from a scan, believe it or not, uh, it eventually arrived, but it was brought by um, a COVID specialist ambulance, it was called. And so um, hey, hello to Hayley Bond and her husband um, from um, somewhere down here in Hampshire. And she runs a, a vet ambulance and she's currently working uh, to bring, get dogs together with their new owners, because otherwise you've got all these um, breeders who are stuck with <laughs> 20 or 30 dogs or something or other and, and they can't cope so you know they have, they have to go to homes and um it was all done perfectly sanitized they arrived in their full ppe and you know we had to stand back and hand the dog over and then squirt it with everything and, and everything else so it was all done properly before anybody says anything but um yeah what difference has it made you know have you done that has it helped your children you know and and uh, you know uh, i just i just like to know because i think it's important that as I said, we're coming out of this and we need to start thinking about the future of the profession. But the future of the profession is only going to work if the future of the bookkeeper is guaranteed as well. You know, we, we want to know personally as well as professionally what it is that makes you tick, any suggestions you've got. And, uh, you know, depending on how many people turn up, let's see how successful this is going to be. And, and I'd love to I'd love to see some of your pooches or, or whatever else you want, want to bring forward. Um, uh, Carol Gibson wants to book a place. Good, absolutely. Um, and I'm sure there are others as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm pleased about that. I, I, I've heard so many people saying you should have a dog, and June and I were not quite sure. We thought, well, we'll wait till later. We'll wait till later, and then thought, no, actually, let, let's go for it. Let's get a dog. So, uh, those of you who've been trying to buy a dog recently, it's not quite as easy as it sounds. Uh, they go very, very quickly. Um, and uh, but anyway, he's. Uh, He's now ours, and Barkley, who's sitting here fast asleep, so he's, he's a good dog at the moment. It's, um, he, um, yeah, it, it's it's certainly lightened the load, as it were. So, great. Anyway, that that's that's Woofer Wednesday, as I'm calling it. Excellent. Um, this is the problem where, we, as we move forward, I'm, I've now set myself a, a task of coming up with uh, days which only work with, you know, the, the same letter. So... <laughs> The trouble is that there's a lot of S's. So unless everybody suddenly wants a Saturday and a Sunday, I think we're a bit stuck. But anyway, never mind. So um, there we are. Jackie, anything? OK, no, I don't think so. We're, we're moving rapidly into uh, dogs. Sylvia says her, she'll give it a try, but her dog is rather big and bouncy. And some of the others are saying, lovely, our cat clicks is entertained. Uh, oh, and Sarah says, uh, what breed is he? What breed? He's a boxer. A boxer. Yeah, and I'm quite surprised because looking at most pups, they look nothing like what they're going to grow into. But boxers, and I've never had a yeah, he's before, a, he's definitely just a, a big dog. And that's tiny. it. He, he's exactly what he's going to look when he gets older, but smaller. 
Um, so yeah, um, he's, he's good. He's a bit like me. He's house trained. Um, and so <laughs> we're having some fun at the moment, which is great. Uh, but anyway, okay, I, mean, I think, Time I think die. that's all. Uh, oh, Kirsty says, I bet he wags when he bends in half. I'm not sure about that one, Kirsty. <laughs> well, he's a he's a fully tailed boxer. Um, it's it's a little boy, obviously, Bar uh, Barkley, um, and he's not a dock tail. He's not one of the actually they they going off track a bit really, but uh, lots of dogs are actually naturally um, stub tailed now. But mm. we went for a long tail, and there's nothing better than seeing that tail wagging as you come down to see him in the morning. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, the only other comment that I probably will finish on this one for comments um, before Gary finishes from Sarah. There are a lot of directors that try to bully bookkeepers into changing payslips for mortgage. A lot of bookkeepers have told me this. Yeah, that's a whole other perhaps topic of conversation as to uh, trying to be bullied into change your accounts for for whatever reason. Okay. I yes, think... Sylvia, I'm not going to mention that one on air. I don't think <laughs> I'm that's just going to say, anyway. I'm not going down that last comment. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I can assure okay. you it's the tail that's wagging. But anyway, um, so it's lovely to see you all. Well, not to see you all, but to be with you all again. I'm actually hopefully going to see a lot more of you on, um, on, on Wednesday. If we get a lot of people, we might have to stage it. But, you know, it, it'll be good. I think it'll lighten the load a little bit. Uh, the sun's coming out. Although Jackie and I apparently are both going to get snow next week. I don't know what the rest of you are like, but down yeah, the, Sunday the we're supposed to, we're even supposed to be getting snow here in our little corner up in Kent. But when it comes down from the northeast, it hits us first. So yeah, but um, anyway, so anyway. we will we will see you all. So we look forward. Mike is still doing Mike Monday, and uh, just so that you know, um, oh, I mean, it's snowing I, in Aberdeen, by the way, big time. Yeah, I think it's heading oh, in my direction, Suzanne. Uh, Okay. Um, as you know, we have an inspection process and our members of council who you elect onto council, who are, push, who are uh, persuaded to go onto council, um, they have to be extra squeaky clean. And I'm very pleased to say that over the last, uh, I think, week, 10 days, both the chair, uh, Paul Avisi Smith and vice chair, Stephen Worrell, have passed their inspection with flying colour. So it's good to know the people that are leading youth in the council have done the job properly. So congratulations to those two. And uh, it, it adds to the number now. We're getting through the council slowly. We're, we're, I think we've done several others. Lucy Brown, she was successful. And Catherine Pyman was successful. So there's, so there's, a, there's a lot going on. But anyway, so... Okay, uh, two quick more comments from me, right. Gary. Uh, Bev, yes, the answer to your question for me is yes, it is. You know what your question was. And Sarah says it's really sunny, tropical Glasgow's paradise. Right. Okay. It's, yeah. Well, okay. Lovely right. Here. So, um, from a, a sunny Romsey and, uh, 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 well, showery but sunny Romsey and uh, we'll we will see you next week I'll see mm -hmm. you on Wednesday if we can manage to get the task force together the the people who want who will talk to you about the fraud then I'll be here on Tuesday as well now as I say if we can um, the gentleman in question who we want to get on here has got a lot of television commitments and um, a couple of radio commitments and we're trying to squeeze in in the middle somewhere in between we're trying to squeeze into the middle of these other commitments if not it will be a few days later but we will be told about it and you know it's a bit eye-watering what goes on out there so it, it would be worth uh, just listening in uh jackie thank you very much another another good day i think thank you uh, um uh, you said it wasn't it wasn't gonna be as much we thought it was going to be an early early bath but apparently not um well it's, uh, lots of lots of lovely questions it and it's nice sometimes to have some some light-hearted stuff on a Friday afternoon to chat about. So yeah, that's good. No, I think we've covered a lot today. So thank you. Well, yeah, I'm fed up with being called the grumpy old money laundering person. So you know, <laughs> I, it's nice to be able to talk about something nice for a change. So yeah, yeah. right, folks. Um, look Have forward a lovely to weekend, all. Week. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.